The stone that the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing, and it is amazing in our eyes. Let me offer a little bit of context before we move into this parable today. At this point in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus has just entered Jerusalem on the donkey with palms and branches and cloaks carpeting his path. And as he enters Jerusalem, the tension that has been building between him and the religious leaders is escalating. Jesus has come proclaiming the kingdom of God. Jesus himself embodies that kingdom in everything he says and does. His teachings, his actions, his very spirit are clashing with the established religious authorities and how they parse out God's covenant law so that it has become a heavy burden to the people. The place of Israel as God's chosen people, and more pointedly, the temple and the temple authorities as the chosen location of God's covenant law has become an oppressive mechanism. So the tension heightens when Jesus goes into the very temple and drives out those who are selling and buying. He proclaims that that grand temple is a house of prayer, God's house of prayer. And he has the audacity in God's house to heal the lame and give sight to the blind. Right there. The chief priests and elders are waiting for him the next day when he comes back. And they challenge his authority again. If his authority came from God, well then... God had failed to check in with them. In response to this challenge, Jesus tells three parables about Israel's place in God's purpose. And our parable today is the middle one. It kind of goes like this. A successful young man who lived in Detroit took a trip to California. He had always lived in the Motor City, So when he got to the Golden State and drove through its regions, he was amazed. The lush vineyards, the stretches of farmland yielding green leafy vegetables, the orchards with rows of almond and pistachio trees, and the orange trees in their groves. He became enthralled with the thought of owning some of this rich, fertile land and establishing a state-of-the-art farm. He made calls, he did some research, he contacted some land agents, he met with successful owners and the skilled farmers that worked the land to pick their brains. And in the end, after much perseverance and expense and trial and error, he had a profitable farm that was managed by skilled farmers whom he trusted. He respected their knowledge of the land. He respected their suggestions for innovation and change. He took them seriously. This was a joint effort. They and their families resided on the land and took pride in the fruit of their labors. He was a fair man. He and the farmers arrived at an agreement as to how to split up the profit each year when the vegetables and fruits and nuts were harvested and sold. As the years went on, he had a comfortable assumption about this happy status quo between him and his co-workers, the farmers. As the years progressed, he became a father. He became a grandfather. The tenant farmers grew older and replaced themselves as best they could with new workers. And the story of their beginnings came to be no longer remembered. The memories of shared aspirations and successes faded away. What had been such a tried and true arrangement had eroded. 
Early on, the farmers would make the trek to the owner's house and give him his share, and they would celebrate together the great harvest um, that, that they had brought about. But one year, they didn't show up, and so the man decided that he needed to send someone to them. When he sent representatives, he said, remind the farmers of, of our agreement, remind them of what we hold so sacred in this great endeavor that we are on about. So the representatives approached the farmers and tried to have a meeting with them, but the representatives were threatened and bullied and driven away. The owner was not completely surprised. Communications hadn't gone so well the past few years. He sent another group of reps, this time with a little bit of legal clout. But again, they were attacked by thugs who shouted, get off our land and don't come back. Their land has made no sense. <coughs> How could such a marvelous enterprise turn so dark? Where was the strong sense of trust and shared success? How could something so rock solid crumble into nothing? Finally, the owner, clinging to the narrative that had carried them through the years, asked his son to go in his stead. Surely there were one or two people left who would remember the old days and respect the son and make a connection. But there was not a thread of trust or relationship to be found. In fact, these tenants who had never even met the owner surmised that if they killed the son, there would be no heir and they would have the land de facto. When Jesus told this parable about the vineyard, his listeners would have readily recognized it as coming from the prophet Isaiah a love song that the prophet writes for God, in which God plants a vineyard on a very fertile hill, puts a fence around it, builds a watchtower for protection, and this pleasant planting is none other than God's covenant people, Israel. And God foresaw and imagined what it would be like to tend them and to provide for them and to share life with them. But the people stopped participating. They forgot how much God had loved them and provided for them. They forgot that all this pleasant planting came from God in the first place. They were too short-sighted to imagine the joys of living within such providence. They went their own way, did their own thing, and lost touch with the source of goodness and life that had so tenderly cared for them, and their lives, their society, Isaiah says, yielded wild, bitter grapes. The people of Israel, God's beloved, pleasant planting, had rejected God. And from the Psalms, we know that the Hebrews, a slave people, were rejected by the builders of civilization and God raised them up to be the cornerstone of God's saving actions in this world. It's also true throughout the scriptures that God has said over and over in the Psalms, and Jesus has said over and over, that God will tear down the mighty who in their conceit reject the poor and lowly, and God will raise the poor and lowly up and such as them will be the cornerstone of his people. The chief priests and elders in the temple rejected Jesus. He was the stone they rejected. The apostles referred to Jesus as the cornerstone of the new world that God is creating. And Jesus' followers are called the living stones, the temple with no walls, the body of Christ that God is building. But the stone, God's labor of love, that the builders reject, well, 
the elders and the scribes, they, they go for punishment and they think the owner is going to come and, and ruin those wretched tenants. And Jesus says, no. Stone the builders rejected, it, it has not vanished. God raises it up. God raises it up to be the cornerstone for all, pe- for all time and all people. When we turn to Paul, Paul expressed to the Philippians that he was not lacking in credentials. In fact, they were indeed very pre- pos- impressive. His pedigree, his education, his political standing, his religious piety. He could stand on his own two feet with the Romans and the Jews alike. But when he stumbled over God's cornerstone, the living presence of Christ on that road to Damascus, he realized that it wasn't what he had gained in life that mattered at all. In fact, he needed to be free of everything that he had gained so that he could know Christ. It was who he had gained that meant everything to him. When he encountered Jesus, he did not meet a God who would put the miserable miserable wretch that he was to death. No. In Jesus, God took the stone the builders rejected and set a cornerstone of forgiveness and new life. And Paul latched onto that with every fiber of his being. Paul knew the only way that he could be fully alive was to be alive in Christ. And if he stood on the cornerstone of God's love as he found it in Jesus, he was absolutely sure that there was no law, no structure, no system that could withstand that bedrock power. Friends, we are invited We are invited by our creator God, our gracious God, to be a pleasant planting. And oh, what God has provided for us. Our creation God has provided everything that we need in nature. And then God sends the Son, flesh and blood, human being, who shows us what it means, what it looks like to be a human being made in the image of God. And Jesus walks with us to teach us how to be fully human, how to be children of God. And then we are provided with Spirit who guides us into all truth. I'll close with a hymn, a verse that just came to me yesterday when I was walking and thinking about you today. And it reminds me so much of the pleasant planting that God wants us to be. For the beauty of the earth, for the glory of the skies, for the love which from our birth over and around us lies. Lord of all, to thee we raise this, our hymn of grateful praise.